Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, WP development panel on APIs and uh, WordPress related APIs. My name is Jonathan Daggerhart. I do WordPress development and uh, plugins and whatnot. I uh, have a little bit of experience with APIs, but our panelists here have significantly more. So uh, I'd like to go through, I'd like to introduce you or have each panelist introduce themselves, starting with Julian, and tell us a little bit about uh, their experience with APIs. Thanks, Jonathan. So my name is Julian Melissus. Um, my Twitter handle is at Julian Melissus. Um, I'm a WordPress developer, front-end developer mostly. Um, I, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say about myself actually, but I work on the Roots team. Um, I also really enjoy building front-end web applications with JavaScript and also I've started with WordPress and that's very much still where my heart is. Um, I recently have worked on a couple projects that used APIs from, for one reason or another. Um, most recent thing, actually, I built uh, an API with Jonathan uh, over a weekend project, and it helps to power a pretty full functioning um, Angular front end before I was using um, Ember for part of that project. And um, uh, I've just been, you know, I, other things that I've used APIs for and, and uh, find them in general a really interesting topic and pretty helpful as well. Sweet. My name's Micah Wood. I'm a WP Scholar on Twitter. And uh, I am a partner and CTO in a company called New Clarity. I do uh, primarily WordPress enterprise projects. I've done, as far as APIs go, I've used uh, Backbone and Ember to in interact with the WordPress REST API. And in general, I've done some integrations with uh, a number of different Google APIs from Google Analytics to Google Geocoding and so on and so forth. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Bowen. My Twitter handle is ALAPAPA. -A -A. Doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> so I work at Automatic on WordPress.com. Um, we uh, have been using JavaScript front-end frameworks for a while. Um, at first, we were rolling a lot of our own stuff and using jQuery for, for network calls and just you know popping it into the DOM like everybody else. Um, but we started using Backbone on a few projects before Backbone was in WordPress core. Um, and we've kind of moved a lot of stuff off Backbone these days. We're doing most of our, our front-end views, our React components. Um, but we have our own REST API that also predates the, the WP API that's just at version two. That's the, the feature plugin in WordPress. So we are interested in kind of uh, coalescing our, our REST API with the WP, WP API plugin using some code from there where it makes sense and vice versa. And uh, yeah, thanks for sticking around. Hey everyone, I'm Adam Solarstein. I work for an agency called TenUp and we're a VIP preferred partner, build a lot of enterprise websites. Um, I have a good bit of experience dealing with the REST API, I've built a couple things on top of that and also several other kind of things that connect to other APIs, so. Um, and in my spare time, I'm a farmer. <laughs> hey, I'm Will. I'm a senior developer for a company called Body Knoll Enterprises. We own and manage about 350 uh, restaurant chains. And um, before that, I worked for an agency that built a ton of WordPress stuff. And currently, I'm building a Angular front end, um, REST API back end. Uh, for the enterprise for my company, and uh, WordPress is, is part of that using the, the WordPress JSON REST API, and the other end is uh, CodeIgniter REST API. So um, I have really only done Angular front end work, um, not to take anything away from the other technologies, that's just what I've always picked up and, and done, um, but I've also done a lot of jQuery and stuff like that. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to get this started, I think, with the most relevant question, which is APY. <laughs> Why do you use an API? When do you use an API? Where is it valuable? Um, and let's just start with Will with the microphone. So like I said, I'm in the enterprise level, so I'm looking long term. Uh, one thing I do believe is in two, three, four, five years, I'm not sure what the best front end technology is. So to me, building up a REST API for my PHP and my data 
and decoupling that from my front end makes a lot of sense because I don't believe there's going to be that much change in PHP or the data or the MySQL or anything like that. So um, I can build the foundation of that and then interchange the front end as I see fit. So I don't care who or what, well I care who's consuming it, but I don't care who in my organization is consuming my information for my REST API. It can be a native app, it can be a web app, or it can be a site. Um, so that to me is the, the big promise of the REST API and building a, a very front end only client to consume it. Um, why use an API? I, I guess just to get a, a great way to get data um, for your application. Um, I work a lot in WordPress core. One of the things I'm excited about is being able to get and send data back to WordPress without the kind of legacy of backwards compatibility that we have to maintain in core. So you can build things on top of the REST API or any API um, that are independent. You're, you're pretty much in your own world. All you really need to do is be sure that you're sending the information and receiving the information in the correct format. And then you're free to do kind of whatever you want inside your application. Um, also, just, just an amazing amount of data out there that's usable. Um, and the way that you can combine multiple APIs. Um, so I did one project where uh, it, was a, it was a search feature where you could put in a, a zip code and get a list of kind of nearby stores from this particular vendor. And it, it involved querying a couple of APIs. One was the, the Google API to kind of geolocate based on the zip code. And then once you had that location, querying another API that would actually, you know, that was from the vendor that would actually locate which stores were in that area. You can do that all right inside WordPress um, using the, the remote API that WordPress provides, cache that data, and then use your API to feed that data back to your application that's running in the client's um, you know, browser. And then I guess the last piece is just that it's running in the client's browser. So the big advantage there is if you have a large scale application, you're kind of offloading a good bit of your processing to the actual client. You can, you know, you've got the data at the client and you can do a lot of manipulation of the data there as opposed to having to rely entirely on your server to do all that. So for me, uh, the reason to use an API, it comes down to a couple things in addition to what these gentlemen have already said. Um, it, the first one is testability. So if you're separating your concerns, your REST API or whatever the API is has a set of input, which are the parameters that you give it, and it has an output. And those things are very easily testable. You can call it with a command line curl, expect an output, get it, run it through your test um, suite pretty easily. Um, whereas if you're using traditional WordPress, WordPress templating with the logic interspersed and that sort of thing, it, it's very, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to test that each component does what it's supposed to. Um, and I, I, I guess that the other part is that it lets me think about them separately. It, it, it keeps them simpler. Your, your REST API functions only do one thing, they return the data. Your display functions only do one thing, they turn the data into a display. Um, so it, it lets me think about them in a simpler fashion. It lets me um, let each component do its own job and not worry about what anything else is doing. It lets them be um, decently dumb about what other components do. So I'm going to, again, say that all that is great. I'll try to add my bits and make sure that Julian has nothing left to talk about. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, for me, I think, I think APIs are great when you want to do some rapid prototyping um, because there's so many things out there that, that already do bits and pieces of what you need that if you can just tie the right things together, you can come up with some awesome stuff and do it in a quick and relatively easy way. Um, and after you've integrated with a few APIs, it gets easier and easier and easier to do. So, so that's one of the things that I like about it. Um, and just because um, also, you know, typically, you know, there's some great services that, that do a lot of technical things that would take hours and hours and hours to build. It's kind of like WordPress, you know, you have a great foundation, you know, why throw it away and write it from scratch when it's right there and ready to use. So if you've got a, a good API that does something you know, that would take you a long time to do. Don't, don't try and reinvent the wheel. Yeah, you guys said a lot of really good stuff. <laughs> um, I think I can at least speak to, I'm probably the least full stack developer, um, at least with experience working full stack than everybody here at the table. Um, as a front end developer, I recently worked on a project um, where I just did a lot of UX and UI design with my business partner who's a designer. 
I ended up writing all the HTML and CSS. Um, I kind of came up with like their own bootstrap for this company to use as repeating patterns throughout this application. And one hurdle that we found was I actually hand off HTML and uh, CSS files to the devs um, because they didn't have an environment that was like, I was able to get set up on my computer to directly work with real data. So the entire time I was working with completely fake data that we that wouldn't necessarily always cover the right use case. So uh, one thing that would have been really helpful in that project would be for the back end uh, to, to have been built on an API. If the back end was just, if I could just call JSON from their back end and get some information back, I would be able to pretty easily render it, know what kind of data I'm looking at, and be able to, I think more quickly, work on the application without a lot of back and forth from the front end to the back end developers. And it's kind of what he said, we don't know what front end is going to look like in five years. We don't know if there's going to need to be a mobile app down the road. So by very much separating your application logic and your data in the back end and your presentation layer, you get a lot of that. It's, it's a huge benefit just maintainability wise. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes. This may sound like a foolish question, but it seems obvious to me. You, you, said, you said, why use an API? Why not? I mean, why would you, how, let me rephrase it. What's the alternative to using an API? Sure, OK. So let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the situations in which uh, writing a front end that consumes an API would be a disadvantage or just too much work. Or, um, so Julian, do you want to start? Maybe just list a uh, situation in which you would rather not have to consume an API as a developer. Sure. Uh, I could also start, is everybody comfortable with the concept of an API? I guess we forgot to ask that. It's, that might is, be valuable. Is everybody, I'm just wondering, is everybody get, we're storing data somewhere, and we're doing all of our application logic there, and then we're going to grab the data from that and use it Sometimes on the front end, but also not, not always on the, on the front end and the client side. Okay, okay, so we're good. So uh, my, my, mine can be really small, but um, if I'm just starting out and I'm wanting to get down to the nitty gritty of WordPress and kind of understand how it works, make some database calls, um, get how we're gonna store post data and retrieve post data, that's, a, we've been building WordPress sites for a really long time using PHP. You can echo a variable and you can put it on a page. That's going to get you very quickly more familiar with how it works than having to add an, an a whole other layer on top, of your, on top of your project. So as a beginning developer, it might be better to start without an API in the mix. OK. And <clears throat> yeah, and to add on to that, so there's plenty of times where um, you know, an API is just another request, something that happens behind the scenes that could slow things down. And if you're going for high performance or um, sometimes even flexibility, um, APIs can have limitations that could, could keep you from getting what you want. So for example, I think Adam was mentioning um, using like the Google Geo uh, Geolocation API to, to find out a, the specific uh, coordinates of a location and then hitting another API to try and figure out if this thing is near this other thing. Um, I've done similar things, but I found that um, that by storing some of that geolocation information in the database and then being able to run like the Haversine formula in PHP or in MySQL, I can get that data much faster than having to make a, a, another request to another API. So, so speed is and performance can be part of it. Um, I'd kind of just to add on the um, the inexperience point, if if you really only know PHP or you really only have you know experience exposure to PHP, JavaScript can be a little daunting. So if you don't have any uh, in job, any JavaScript experience at all, um, that would be a good use case for just keeping everything in PHP. Now that's not to say that that um, you know you can't use a PHP style architecture inside PHP. You can definitely do that, and. Uh, I think it's important, we're kind of describing what an API is. It's important to, to tell, to talk about, like an API isn't just a REST API. It's not just something that you call over the internet. Um, any sort of, of, of 
interface to your logic that you are providing somebody else to use is an API. It stands for Application Programming Interface. And what it amounts to is it's a contract with your users, that this is going to um, take the inputs that are described in the documentation. It's going to act in the way it says. It's going to output a format like this. So even if you're not using a remotely accessed API, um, you know, if you're using WordPress functions, that's an API as well. It's just a different kind. Um, so really, I think what we're talking about here is just the mentality of separating logic and, you know, putting things into components. Um, so like, those are things that you eventually become better at after you do it time and time again. So I guess that an experience is, is really the best use case for not doing it. That was a good question, because uh, I hadn't thought about that, like why I wouldn't use an API. A um, couple things that have bit me with APIs before, uh, breaking changes, like the REST API getting ver up, you know, up version two upgrade and suddenly like the endpoint changed and the helper function to find the endpoint isn't in the beta. Um, so sometimes things break you're relying, if you're relying on an external API and it changes. And the other one that I thought of is poor documentation. Uh, Elasticsearch is a great example of this where um, with each version they may change some keywords or change some um, methodologies and then it's not well documented or the old documentation is still out there. Um, so when you're dealing with third party APIs, it can be very frustrating as a developer when they don't perform as documented. Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, they, Sorry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the only part I would like to add is, you know, if you're building a WordPress marketing site, it would hard press for me to really, other than it would be kind of cool just to try out, not to use the WordPress templating system. You know, if you're getting all your information from the WordPress database, you're building a WordPress site, it, it's, it's probably best just to build out the normal WordPress site. I mean, you could just forget the templating system, use the JSON REST API, and build the front end by itself, but I would be hard pressed to really find any real value to that, unless somebody has just some deep pockets that really want something really flashy or cool, but nothing you can't do without the WordPress. So, to me, when, you, when you're looking at applications where you have multiple sources of uh, input, um, you have much more back and forth. Um, if I have a user entering stuff in, I don't want to wait on a page refresh. I want to have the JavaScript to send it back and forth to API, I, you know, the single page apps. That's where I really think the value of using a REST API is. Uh, but more majority of the time, I'm using it because that's kind of what I've gotten into in the pattern. And you could just as easily do a PHP echo that we all set. Sorry. Sorry to break the flow. Um, on the single page application, one thing that we talked about when we were chatting about topics and just wasn't brought up here was an SEO impact. Um, with, with a single, it's just something definitely important to mention, especially for beginners. What we're doing is we're grabbing data and your page never actually reloads, right? Like in a single page app, your page never reloads. You might just stay at the root of that app. So what's gonna happen, and Google has gotten a lot better about it, but there are still some technologies that are either make it a lot harder or Google might not index as fast or might not index at all. Um, your homepage is blank. <laughs> if, you've, if you haven't even gathered any data from the API and you haven't rendered anything, Google is going to see a bank blank page. So there's technologies to help combat this, like PhantomJS, which is like a ghost that goes and crawls all your data and actually renders all the HTML as you make these requests. But that's a lot of extra work. So just to mention, you can't make an application with 50 different views and expect all of those to show up. Um, your e-commerce store is gonna be much more indexable if it's built out and can be rendered so Google can hit those pages. Whereas, you know, you can't have, it's, it won't, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to see it with the, the products if you built it in simply just a front end. Those are great points. So if you have like a one page yeah. checkout, that probably wouldn't be, is that what you're talking about? I'm, I'm so actually, yeah. the, the, the question was if you have a one page checkout, that might be a problem. Yeah. The one page checkout is a different example because the Google doesn't need to be able to crawl the data on that page. I meant more like, say you have 6,000 products in your, in your like store and you just decided to code the entire front end in a single page application, Google might not even know those products exist because when they load up the homepage, they just see, you know, nothing. <laughs>
Well, and I think you brought up in your um, backbone talk that if users don't have JavaScript enabled, then a single page application, uh, you know, the call is never going to happen. All they're going to get is what um, was rendered server side. Um, so if you are targeting government users or something like that, then you, you just can't use this pattern. And, yeah. Great points. Thank you. Does anyone else have another question? If not, then let's move on to discuss specifically the new WordPress REST API that everybody's so excited about. Um, <laughs> uh, if <laughs> we'll, we'll start with Will, and uh, let's just uh, go through some, uh, maybe if you've run into any difficulties with it, things you like about it, just give us your, your elevator pitch for. So about a year ago, I was rolling my own REST APIs, which were fine. I built some production sites on that. and then. I started using the WordPress JSON API uh, plugin that was supposed to be out last year, um, but still hasn't come out. And I, it was great, very simple, very WordPressy. Install the plugin, you get a slash WP JSON and slash post, and you get your post. So it, it worked very much like you would expect it to. Um, just recently, with my um, the enterprise site, we're working on a communications platform. So we need a bunch of users throughout the business to be able to provide input. So immediately I stood up a WordPress site and I'm gonna use the JSON version 2.0 to um, uh, allow it to tap into the, the HTML web app that I'm building out for the intranet. So the experience is, has been uh, probably three or four weeks in the project. It's been great, exactly what you would expect a WordPress um, component to be. They have filters to add endpoints. Um, and then within that filter, you set a callback and then callback Excuse the logic, um, and then you just echo out your information, and it handles the JSON return. Um, you can the version, which I believe the first version didn't allow custom post types. I'm finding the second version is automatically picking up the custom post types. Um, I don't know about taxonomies yet, so it's been what you would expect a WordPress um, component to be. Very, um, the API it uses is with a WordPress API is filters and actions. Um, and it's been very easy, so um, it makes, it, you know, I'm very happy to see how it's going. I'm looking forward to using it. And I'm using that in addition to the other API that I've already built on another platform. So, um, yeah. So. Awesome. Um, so I have built some stuff on top of the API, mostly the 1.0, and then on the 2.0 I did a little bit, uh, just kind of demo stuff. Um, I'm really excited to see it go into core because I think uh, once it's in core, it becomes this massively usable thing that every WordPress site will have. have that uh, the REST API is like the RSS feed of, of the new millennium. Um, you guys remember RSS? <laughs> <laughs> your website still has it. If you just go to slash feed, you'll find a feed of all your data. Uh, this is the new way to get data out of and back into WordPress. Um, and I think once it's in place in core, uh, it's going to be really exciting to see what kinds of things uh, are built on top of it. It's also going to open up the data that's in WordPress sites to the rest of the internet. Um, it's uh, just something where like every single WordPress site that is running this REST API will suddenly have a REST endpoint. So people who are building things on top of APIs will think, oh, I can, that's a WordPress site, I can query that for sure. Um, one of the kind of disadvantages of having it in a plug-in form is if you're trying to build something on top of it, it becomes a dependency of your project. And there is no dependency management, so you're pretty much forced into kind of bundling it with your product, and there's a little bit of a kind of user learning curve there. Um, I guess sort of one of the concerns that I have about it being in core um, and being able to use it is what Thomas raised in his talk. It, um, like right now with WP Ajax, um, you pretty much load all of WordPress with every Ajax callback, which is very inefficient. So I hope that once it does make it into core, we can figure out a way to provide some filters or hooks so that you can bypass a lot of the load if, if you don't need that. Um, but I think getting it into core is like the first step, and I hope we can take that step really soon. I don't have a whole lot to add since I haven't worked um, directly with the WP API plugin, except for just using a, a toy site to kind of play around with Jack Linux's theme um, that uses React. Um, but I think it's. I think it will be helpful. Um, it's really just a name change, but when you're using Ajax, everything's going over the same location. It's just a change in query variable, and it's it's a little bit of like extra work to get the Ajax stuff set up as opposed to the the REST API endpoint. So I think just the simplification of the PHP API 
um, is going to be helpful. So I've, um, let's see, I'm trying to think. So I've done a few things with the API. I've um, used Ember to integrate with the WordPress REST API, and I've also used Backbone to do the same. Um, <coughs> Ember definitely expects your data to be in a very specific format, um, which the, the WordPress REST API doesn't necessarily give you right out of the box. Um, I mean, it, it gives it, you know, the, the WordPress REST API is a very reasonable and, uh, and well-written API. Um, but, you know, with any API, things can be done a little bit differently. And so Ember has certain expectations, whereas the, uh, the WordPress REST API was a little different, but still, you know, equally valid. So uh, there were some things that, uh, in my working with it, where I had the choice of, do I try to adapt the API on the PHP side? so that it actually changes the functionality and the output of the API, or do I go into Ember and try to, um, to adapt it after the fact? Um, so I think I actually ended up doing it in Ember at first and then realizing it would probably be better just to do these things in, in PHP. So with the, I primarily work with the older API where um, it did actually support custom post types, but you had to extend a class. And then if you wanted to be able to get certain post meta, you could, you could use filters to add additional data to that. Um, but you had to do that in multiple contexts and, and several different things. So um, overall, I think I think it's uh, it's definitely uh, like Adam was saying. You know, it's, this is the next big step. It's going to allow us to do tremendous things with WordPress, and uh, so I, I'd be also very happy to see it in Core. I personally have not used the API in any real project, so I don't have a lot to add other than I am really excited to see it go into Core. Um, see it be more adopted. Um, I think when I was originally getting into WordPress development, Ajax was the way WordPress wants to Ajax was really hard for me to get around. So I think API being more standardized through like a lot of developers now that aren't just WordPress developers but coming from other places will be a little more familiar with the, those methods. And uh, maybe I'll just like recode my site in something and then try to figure out how to get Google to index it, but <laughs> recode it in something so that I can have a chance to play with it. Awesome. So also, uh, something that should probably be brought to attention is that the, the WordPress API, REST API that we're talking about is not available through the repo. If you go search through the repo for JSON API, you're gonna find a different plugin. The one we're talking about can be accessed at wp-api.org. Oh, it's in the repo now. It is, too, yeah. But it's just one with almost the exact same name. Yes. Right. It shows right next to it. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. So it's <laughs> look for version 2 in the repo, available probably a long time ago, and I had no idea. <laughs> no, very recently, like last yeah. week. Oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any questions? Then let's move on to uh, talk about consuming the API. Uh, I know... Quite a few of you have used multiple technologies uh, for front-end frameworks, JavaScript. All the buzzwords are out. Let's just get them on the table, and let's have a uh, let's have a throwdown. So, I'd like for each of you. Let's get starting at Julian. Let's go down the line and talk about just mention which technologies you've used and maybe some of the advantages and disadvantages if they were apparent when you used them. Um, I've used two in real projects. Um, two JavaScript buzzword frameworks. Um, first, I started out with Ember, which was actually an interesting choice as a beginner because it's a really bad choice as a beginner. <laughs> um, I really liked the idea of convention over configuration that it takes from the Rails approach, and I do enjoy working with Ruby on Rails. Um, it was really rigid. Like he mentioned, the calls to your API are basically done automatically if you're using Ember data and asking for data. But if your API doesn't have it in that format, you've got to do a lot of workarounds to get that to work. Um, I actually recently moved a project over from Ember because I have done a lot of little projects in Angular. I think it's easier with Angular to just write whatever JavaScript you want, just like Backbone doesn't really get in, get in the way with that. I'm not saying Ember gets in the way with JavaScript in general, but just the conventions, you've got to do it that way. Um, I've really enjoyed working with both of them. I could see different use cases for each, 
Um, and I also would really like to take some time, like two isn't enough. I would love to take some time to play with Ember, uh, sorry, play with Backbone and uh, play with React for the view side because I think that um, they're, m you can use them all for different things, but I think sometimes there may be the right, the right tool for the job. Yeah. So I've used, um, I've used Ember for, um, like I said, working with the REST API. I've also used uh, Backbone uh, and recently had the opportunity to take a project I had completely done in Backbone that was relatively complex and moving it over to Backbone plus React. Um, if, if you have the choice, just go straight to Backbone plus React. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it will make things much faster and not to mention much cleaner and a lot less code and a lot easier to understand and work with. But, yeah. I might have to check that out because my experience is in Backbone and React. And so I'll, I'll leave a little bit of the backbone for you to talk about since your talk was on backbone at this conference. Um, so I'll talk about React a little bit. React, if you're, if you're familiar with the term MVC, model view controller, React tries to stay firmly in the view space. They don't try to do anything with your data um, access or anything like that. So as far as the fetching um, of data and the control through the application, um, Facebook has publicized an architecture called Flux, which um, is the, the recommended way to get data into a React view component. And the kind of, uh, the way that Flux is supposed to work is you have a store, which is kind of analogous to a backbone model, um, but the data is supposed to only flow one way. The views are supposed to be decently dumb about what the data is in the store, um, and the store emits a change event when something changes, and then the view sees the change event just gets the new values and renders if it changes. Um, as far as calling the API, React is decently not involved. So um, your, your fetches have to be controlled elsewhere, and then you write a controller statement, that, or a controller function that handles uh, the input from the response from the server. You send it one way through your React store, and then the views can only do an action. Um, and then you hide all the implementation out of scope from the callers um, so that the store is the only way you can get data through the system. Cool, I'm gonna have to check out React because I haven't done anything with that. Um, so yeah, I mean I got into Backbone heavily when I got involved in WordPress core and helped rewrite revisions for 3.6 and I've continued in core to be involved in various Backbone things that we've done so that's sort of my most, that's my comfort zone and so when I've had projects uh, 10 up that I had to build a front end uh, component that communicate with the back end, I chose Backbone, because it's what I'm familiar with. Um, and it is, it is very minimal and extendable, so like when you run into those issues where the data doesn't come back in the format you expect, it's very easy to kind of extend the sync method to change the data format to what you need. Um, it's just kind of designed that way. Also have spent a good bit of time using the WP Remote API to consume APIs, right? So that's when you're in PHP and you're, you're pulling stuff in from remote APIs. Um, I don't know what else I can say about Backbone. I, it's, um, I feel like any of these uh, frameworks are, are valid and good. I don't think one is really better than the other. <laughs> <laughs> People like to ask that question, you know, like, why do you choose? And mostly I think I've chosen to use Backbone because it is built into WordPress. Um, it's sort of what Core has adopted and I haven't run into the limitations that people have with it. Um, so that's my story. So, I learned Angular because somebody was willing to teach me Angular at the same time someone was willing to pay for me to learn it. <laughs> so, that was about a little, almost two years ago. Um, and I come from, I came from the back end, so I was very much started my life as a database back end, and I've slowly moved up to the front end. And um, JavaScript was something I always hated touching. Uh, you know, I used jQuery as little as I, I could. Um, because it just didn't make sense. And Angular was the first time where I saw JavaScript used in the MVC framework and it really made sense. It's a very declarative. You put all your view logic into the HTML and declarative programming. Um, instead of um, listening to a click in jQuery, um, you say ng click, just like old school on click. And that felt very natural to me. And I just ran with it. So I just, every project I could, I just, I knew a little bit of Angular, I learned a little bit more and no one's ever really taught me or pay, pay for me to learn anything else. So that's the only reason I don't know Ember or React or anything like that. 
Um, also, the fact that Google's backing Angular it makes me feel more comfortable putting in my enterprise. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Um, but yeah, it's very flexible. I find it very easy to stand up a working prototype very quickly, put some dummy data, um, you manipulate the data, and then you have all the view logic that falls into place from that. So there's no more DOM manipulation in the DOMs or in the controllers. You manipulate the data and let a logic put in the view, manipulate that DOM. To me, that makes a lot of sense because it felt very similar to what I was doing in PHP. Um, so yeah, that's the reason why I chose Angular and not to take anything away from any of the other. Yeah, so <clears throat> personally I haven't used Angular, but um, just to kind of help differentiate uh, between things like Ember and Backbone. Um, so having experience with both the, uh, you know, the convention over configuration, if you have something really complex that you need to do and it's going to follow these conventions, the fastest way to get it up and running is to use something like Ember um, so that you spend a lot less time writing boilerplate code. Um, <clears throat> But you have to know what those conventions are and, you know, and, and have made the conscious choice to accept them. And if you don't know what you're getting into, sometimes that can be a little overwhelming. So, um, so it's important that you understand what you're getting into if you're going to just like start doing stuff with Ember. Um, but the nice thing about Backbone and why I think uh, probably part of the reason why it's even in core is because Backbone is extremely flexible and you can only use the pieces you need. Either if you don't need a router, don't use a router. Um, if you don't need, you know, models for some reason, don't use the models. Um, but, uh, and, and then, you know, with React, um, the reason why I think it's a valuable tool, you know, uh, and, and even, the, even how I try to write my backbone code, they, you know, you have the option of doing it however you want, but um, just being able to write code in a modular way where you can just drop it in and reuse it somewhere else. Uh, is one of the one of the reasons why React is such a great thing because it forces you to write components and to think about how the data flows through there, um, and so that changes the way you start to think about how you use tools like Backbone, is because you start to think, well, you know, how can I make this modular? You know, just because I'm using it here and I have a very specific use case doesn't mean I can't, you know, pull out the generic pieces and make it something that I can reuse and then just program a few, you know specific business rules into it and, and make it work. So. Um, I was just going to mention one thing. Distinction-wise, uh, if we start talking about Backbone focuses a lot on models and collections, which means you know what your data looks like. So if you have a car, it has wheels, attribute, you have all these things. And, um, Angular doesn't come with that out of the box. So you've got to use like JS data or something like that, which I personally have never used. Ember data does the same thing as well. So it, you have to directly mirror your backend data, or at least what the JSON spits out with your front end data. And then, so that's how it helps you get up and going really fast. Um, but the more you guys talk about Backbone, the more I realize the next project I'm working on, it could be really helpful to have that flexibility. <laughs> and also get that collection model component from it. I think Backbone is, is the easiest that we've mentioned to add on to an existing project. If you have an existing project and you wanted to do something you know, kind of new and JavaScript-y and interactive and reactive, it's easy to just include the library. It's already in core. Um, you can just uh, require um, or, or, or um, enqueue some script that has Backbone is a requirement, and everything's just handled for you. Um, so it's 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 really lightweight. It's really simple. Sorry. Battle of the stacks. Dude. Learning time-wise, being somebody who's looked into all four of these and probably not the smartest person at this table, um, or two tables, Ang Angular is so easy to learn. It's um, it's almost insane because you're writing HTML. So you have a variable called things, and you just repeat things, and then they just spit out on the page. So it's pretty cool. I mean, it's really easy to get into. Um, I think that's part of the popularity, but uh, it's, I don't think it's always the right tool for the job. And so it's, it's interesting to hear you guys talking about this. And this is probably why each of us have picked a certain two, is based on like our needs, our requirements, where we were, and... Um, and at, at that time, and also, like, who's going to pay us for it? <laughs>
I just wanted to add um, something that I've found hel helpful since the question was about um, dealing with API calls and remote calls and getting data and, and coming in. So we use um, we're, uh, local storage heavily on WordPress.com and on any new project, it's, it's really helpful. Um, what local storage is, is it's kind of a, 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 a schemaless database. It's, it's a key value store in your browser that your browser supports. There's a limit of like 50 megabytes per site or something like that. But you can just set any sort of data in there um, and it's, it stores it as a string and you pull it back in later. Um, and so that's really useful so that the, the user can close out your site, go do other things, close their browser entirely, and as long as you know, that data are still, those data are still valid, you can render the page immediately when they come up. You don't have to wait for it to come back from the server. So it's, if, if you're not using local storage, definitely think about it. And now I'm gonna tell you a really easy way to use local storage, which is um, Paul Irish has a jQuery uh, plugin. It's like less than 100 lines of code and basically any Ajax request, you can add a, uh, an option cache true and you get local storage caching for your Ajax requests. What's your name? Um, if you just Google local storage Ajax request, but the, the author is Paul Irish. And if you're not using jQuery, local storage is a stupidly simple API to use natively. It's a very, and I think it's, Pretty much ubiquitously supported yeah. now. It's so, good yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. There's, yes. This may not be on topic, but uh, I recently ran into a project where they wanted to look at related content from various sites, and it seemed like a really good opportunity to use the REST API instead of trying to move all those sites into some ridiculous multi site monster. I agree with you. I sure. That's well, a good idea. <laughs> that's like multiple sources from multiple domains. That's exactly what the easier transport, Jason's very lightweight. You can get it from A to B. You know exactly what you're getting. I'm going to hijack the mic here <laughs> <laughs> and say that if you're not using Jetpack related posts, they're really good. Um, we use Elasticsearch internally and it, it offloads the processing off of your, your server. Um, so you can, cons I think we actually have an API endpoint on .com, so you can consume those even if you're not using the Jetpack output. Um, it's, it's really quite good, and if you're on a shared host, um, you know, it's, it's gonna eat your, your bandwidth cycle, or your um, processing cycles, and it's gonna slow things down to do related posts. And a hosted service like Jetpack, it's, it's super useful. That was a really valid mic jack. It's super good, and to, for you to have to take the time to set up Elasticsearch, um, they've taken care of it for you. I was gonna say, if you don't do that really smart way to do it, um, I would at least uh, keep in mind you can absolutely consume that with, uh, WP, the, with the WP functions, and one thing that you might want to do, um, depending on how fast your content changes, is store that in a transient, even if it's just for a day or for two days. You're not calling and it's, it's also dead simple. If you look at the WP Transients ABI, API, you're gonna call from one place, call from another place, call from a third place. Uh, you don't wanna have to do that every time someone hits your page. Um, and so just, just saving that information, um, it would really reduce a lot of load. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Yes, sir. Um, do you ever have a situation where you're Pulling information from an API, but then you need to store like additional like metadata with each item from the API. Like if you pull in like ten real estate properties, and you want the client to go select three of them and show them the home page. Well, how do you store that information because it's not in the API? So the question revolved around after you pull data from a third-party API and you want to add your own metadata to it. Is there a great way to store that, or how do you keep up with it? Maybe even keep the original data in sync. So your specific use case I've done before. So uh, specifically with real estate data, real estate API. So, um, so we've had a couple of different use cases, right? Where, so you have featured properties, right? So we've, we've done a few different things, you know, uh, for like agents, we've been able to filter by, you know, you know, all the listings from the API that belong to the agent, something like that, um, but we've also been able to set it up where you know maybe they use a short code and they just set the MLS 
references to it, and then just pull in those specific records. Um, we also set up um, like overrides. So if uh, somebody wanted to override the um, the description for a real estate listing, they could actually go in and we've set up uh, a post type that mirrors and provides very specific fields that they can override. Um, and so that that's basically a post type of metadata. And then when we actually go to process and render the data on the site, we just check to see if there's an override for that specific uh, ID. So. so here's how I'd solve that problem. Um, I would set up a, an API endpoint on your own site so that your front end is calling your own site. You're not calling a third party from your, your, your front end. Um, there are a few reasons why you would want to do that. And primarily the reason is that their, you know, their API might be down. Um, another reason is caching. So you can cache locally in your endpoint um, the response from the third party. So you can, you can have the, the front end always uh, ping your endpoint and serve a cached response really quickly. So to your question about how you would store the additional metadata is if you're going to cache this thing anyway, I would store it in the cache. Um, so you get your response. Um, well, the endpoint gets the request. Is there a cache uh, hit? If there's a cache hit, return. Um, if there's not a cache hit or if you need to update your cache, then you go through, call a third party, then um, iterate through the response, um, annotate it with whatever you need to annotate it with, then save that data structure to the cache. So next time it just gets spit out as soon as it's requested. This probably isn't helpful for your use case, but I thought I would mention, um, <laughs> I thought I would mention if it's just simple data and you're, like maybe you're trying to merge two collections of data and you're doing this client side, I thought this would be a good time to mention libraries like underscore, um, not underscore's theme, but underscore the JavaScript utility library, as well as it's like, other thing, cousin uh, Lodash. Um, uh, Backbone comes with underscores, so you're going to get that if you're using native WordPress stuff. Um, Lodash and underscore both include like merge functions for objects. So you've, you've already gotten your array and you just want to add like maybe even just an identifier or like a counter if it didn't come with an ID. You can easily use like an, an each function to help you add some of that metadata. But this is again on the, on the client side like JavaScript, the client side. <laughs> so, um, and, and one of the things that uh, you can do like with a lot of these uh, JavaScript frameworks is, um, uh, particularly I know with Ember, like you can have computed fields. So like if, if what you're trying to add as metadata is actually computed, mm -hmm. you can actually create a field in, in, the, um, in the JavaScript environment that, that basically will take these two fields and calculate it and it will, and it'll, you know, Do you have some? Yes. yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Great. Any any other use cases questions? This is a different question. Okay. What? Well, all right. Um, in that case, case I uh, I have a question. I just want everybody to go down and tell me there if I if I was going to pick up all of these frameworks tomorrow. What is the must-have tool for your framework of choice? Not counting console log, I can do that one. Um, I'm taking Ember you, then. You can you can <laughs> repeat the same tool. It's cool. okay. Um, cool thing about Ember data because it's in your client is that it's aware of the current state of your application, where the data is in your application, and again, your application's in your browser. So some brilliant souls built the uh, Ember add-on for Chrome. And that actually lets you inspect the current application state of your data, where your views and components are being rendered, like if they've mounted or not, all of your application's routes, um, and also kind of the current status of each individual view. So if I was picking an Ember project, I'd absolutely use uh, that Chrome extension. I think there's a Firefox extension too. I just don't think it's kept as up to date as the Chrome one. It's called Ember Data. Uh, it's just well, Ember Data is an add-on to Ember um, that lets it do the data stuff, <laughs> like the models and collection stuff, um, and a lot else. Um, but this is a Chrome extension. If you just look up like the data, I think it's Ember Inspector, Chrome ins extension. 
But um, if you look for Ember Chrome extension, that's the one that should pop up. It's really, it's really handy to have. Yeah, so, uh, so as far as tools go, um, so yeah, really understanding what's going on is the most important thing. So, you know, documentation is important, but it's not really a tool. So, um, so that, yeah, the next best thing is, for me, uh, Chrome DevTools gives me a lot of functionality, and I'm f very familiar with it and can get a lot done there. And when you're working with, um, you know, frameworks like Ember, like you said, you know, having that debugging tool that's specific to that thing you're trying to do is extremely helpful. And React actually has the exact same thing where you can actually hover over and it tells you that this thing you're on is part of this React component and that it, you know, pulls from this data source and so on and so on. Um, so having those debugging tools are extremely helpful. Uh, but then also on the, on the other side, when you're actually writing the code, having a, an IDE or something that, that really recognizes the code you're writing. You know, if you're dealing with React, you know, it, it recognizes JSX and it, you know, it can do syntax highlighting and it can lint the code as you're typing it so that you can see that the second that you type something that you've done it wrong and you can just go fix it real quick before you ever get to trying to, you know, compile and actually run the code. So about React, I think that what really sets it apart is um, it, it's a couple things. There are lifecycle methods that are kind of built into the view framework. And like I said before, React is just the view portion uh, mainly. And so you have uh, lifecycle methods like um, component is uh, or should component update that you can override and component uh, will mount and component did mount and component will unmount and component did unmount. So you know exactly when in the life cycle of this component this code is going to run. You don't have to deal with callbacks or promises or anything like that. It just, it, it greatly d decreases the cognitive overhead of, of, of mounting these components in the DOM and when your code's running. Um, so you don't have to deal with callbacks and crazy stuff. And the other thing um, that React really stands out for me is, is it's, it's really designed to be componentized. And um, something that kind of took me a little while to grasp is, is the JSX format for writing um, the render method. And it's really kind of interesting because it looks a lot like you're writing HTML. It's kind of like, like Angular, that it's, you're writing declarative HTML, um, but the thing that is a tag, um, more often than not, it's not, a DOM, it's not an actual browser component, like a div or a span or something like that. Um, it's going to be another React component that you require earlier in your module. So I could say require slider or something like that. And then I just do an open bracket slider, pass it some properties, give it some children, like a, a slider cell. That can be another React component. And I think just that design architecture really helps you. Um, there, there are even third party tools coming out that help you build React components um, without providing it any data. And you can build it separately from um, from your app, I think it's called React UI Builder. There's a, a, um, a project that uh, is really relatively new, and you can build an entire layout. And in fact, like designers who, who don't code, who know HTML, can come in and use these things, and uh, and build pretty pretty robust layouts. And and programmers can then, can then pick it up and you know add the state uh, handling and and put live data to it. So I just think that the emphasis on the modularity of the view. Um, it's really important. Uh, yeah, Chrome Debugger. I spent a lot of time in Chrome Debugger. I don't know if there's a backbone Chrome Debugger extension, but I'm going to go look right after the talk. <laughs> um, I'm just going to mention a couple other tools that I use a lot. Uh, one is called Dash, and it is an offline documentation repository. Works really well in combination with Alfred, which is a kind of shortcut thing on the Mac. And it's just super easy to hit the shortcut, type dash, and the name of the function that I'm trying to reference. I don't have to go on the web. I've got it. I can use it offline. But it's more just that it's instantaneous. And it's got documentation for everything you've ever used. So it's not just for Backbone, but any library you use, you can download a doc set for it. Um, so I really like that tool. For querying APIs, I've used Postman a lot, which is a um, Chrome extension. Someone recently told me about a tool that's supposed to be better than Postman, but I don't remember what it is called. But Postman is awesome. You can run it standalone as well. And it just lets you set up like a, a specific API request and see the results kind of right in a, in a place where you can easily adjust parameters and, and kind of mess around with the request without having to do it programmatically. 
So I'm completely dependent on PHP Storm. It has almost everything. Um, it has the REST API tool, a lot of the tools I need, um, especially when I'm dealing with Angular. Um, and I too like the component. If you look at my JavaScript, I have many, many files and all of them do very little things. Um, so to be able to hit a shortcut on a declarative function and it takes where I've declared that function automatically and in indexing, uh, that's really important to me. And another thing would be um, grunt or gulp. Um, having something just running in the background, uh, I can put my files in my folders and it looks, okay, here's a SAS file I'm automatically including in your SAS. Here's a JavaScript file I'm automatically including it um, in your development. So the way if you look at my index file, um, when I'm developing, I have all individual files included at the bottom of my page one by one as I'm developing. And when I go to distribute distribute it, uh, it's all concatenated into a single file. So when I'm looking at the error code, I know exactly what file I'm working on in development, but I still have, just by a click of a button, it just concatenates, minifies, and puts it on when I'm ready to push it production. Um, so I guess those two things, which Storm is kind of a cheat, because it has a ton of tools built into it. Um, but that's, I don't know if I could develop without those, you know, efficiency awesome. at least. Thank you. Since you brought up build tools, I'll, I'll just uh, throw out a blanket recommendation. Whether you're using Grunt, Gulp, Make, whatever, um, using a build, build tool for your JavaScript just greatly decomplexifies things. It's kind of like I was talking about with the React components. Um, you don't have to think about when things are coming because typically with JavaScript, you know, you include a script tag and your browser's gonna go out and request it and it might take a you know, couple milliseconds to come down. Um, you would have to think about in your, your code that you're writing your application code, okay, is this library loaded before I call it? So the typical fallback is I'm going to wait now until um, the document's actually ready. You know, it's, it, if, as long as the script tag's not in the footer or something like that, if the document has been rendered, then you're pretty safe to move on and assume things are, are, uh, are, are um, defined. Um, but if everything is, like you said, concatenated into a single file, whenever your application JavaScript comes down, you know that everything is defined. You know that you're able to just call a thing that should be defined and it is. And I was just gonna mention as a tool, if you're using Ember, it's highly recommend, you don't always have to because you can include it in the page. But if you're using Ember, it's highly recommended that you're using Ember CLI, which is their, they have their whole build process with Broccoli. It's kinda like Gulp or Grunt. And then they have, um, a whole application project structure. Again, with the rigid, but um, a good tool. Awesome, well, thank you all very much. And I think that wraps up our developer panel on APIs. Let's give them a hand. <laughs>